At a time when investors are confronted with market volatility and a variety of challenges fueled by the uncertainty of inflation, unsettled geopolitical tensions, and economic pressures, Justin Klein and Steve Peasley stand ready to take your finance and investment questions and share their unbiased answers. This is Invest Talk, independent thinking, shared success. Invest Talk is made possible by KPP Financial, a registered investment advisor firm serving clients throughout the United States. The clarity for your path forward starts now. Here is KPP Chief Executive Officer, Financial Advisor, Justin Klein. Good afternoon, fellow investors, and welcome back to Invest Talk. This is our September 22nd, 2022 edition, and we are in the final days of the third quarter. Only six more trading days left. And the big question is, how are you handling the current market volatility? This shouldn't be a shock to you. Uh, this is an adjustment period, higher rates, a slowing economy, and that tends to bring uncertainty and uncertainty means volatility. And I'm going to do my best this hour, as always, to answer your finance and investment questions and give you some perspective and knowledge in order to make good decisions with your money, with your financial life, with your investment dollars. So I'm Justin Klein, and the phone number to reach me today is always 888 chart It's our anytime 24-7 listener line, and you can call that right now, whether you're listening after hours or during our live stream program from 4 to 5 Pacific time. Now, I've got a packed podcast for you today, and my, my focus point concerns the story behind this question is that I bond yield worth your attention. We've talked a little bit about I-bonds, but I want to give you some updates on the yield to expect going forward and a little refresher on the pros and cons of the I-bond space. Also, we're going to look at the mortgage or the housing market, and we had a report yesterday on home sales, so we're going to look, uh, do a little deep dive into that. And then Wall Street, well, some of the Wall Street's largest banks, the head of the, those banks, CEOs, uh, testified in front of Congress yesterday, and we're going to look at what they said as well. And then lastly, loans are becoming cheaper than the yields on corporate bonds. And this is pretty interesting, and it shows you the opportunity that's lying in the corporate bond space today. So we're going to look at all of that, hopefully, if we have time. And I see we have some voice bank input questions as well on deck. One about FAX, which is the Aberdeen Asian Pacific Income Fund, and one on retirement. So of all this planned for this episode of Invest Talk, and once again, you can call me at 888 chart Now let's take a look at the market today. The S&P was down about 32 points, a little more, a little less than 1%. You had the the real big sell off was in the Russell, which had been holding up pretty nicely, but definitely had a solid uh, down day today, over two percent on the Russell to the downside. So that was an interesting change of characteristic today. Uh, but the losses were mainly concentrated in the growth side of the market: small cap growth down three point one percent, mid cap down two point seven three, large cap growth down two point one seven. But large cap value only down 0.34 today. And a lot of that had to do with the fact that oil, uh, most a lot of oil stocks were up uh, and that certainly helped the, the the value side of the market and higher interest rates. We talked about this before. Higher interest rates were uh, a hallmark of today's uh, market. The 10-year up 20 basis points and you're starting to see the 10-year kind of go no bid. And it looks like Japan is starting to back off uh, in order to use those dollars to defend their currency. Because the yen, which is interesting today, the yen was actually strong. You would think that uh, with a higher interest rates and a, a hawkish Fed on yesterday's uh, announcement that the yen would be weak. Uh, that's not the case. The yen reversed on the, on the Fed announcement and it continued today. So that was a, a bit of a change in character. Gold was also up uh, today, and that was a uh, divergence here. You would think a hawkish Fed, higher rates, that should be 
uh, negative for uh, gold, but it's not. And that's one of those signs that when Sen is really bad on a particular sector and there's a news that should hurt a particular company or sector and it does not go down, it kind of means most of selling is gone. And uh, it's a often marks an inflection point. So I thought that was uh, pretty interesting. Same with the dollar. The fact that the dollar uh, was uh, up yesterday, um, but closed well off its highs and didn't really rally again today on the fact that the, uh, you know, the dollar or the interest rates were, were up uh, nicely. So uh, it'll be very interesting to see how the economic data flows in over the next month or two. And you're likely to see inflation really take a hit as the, uh, you know, nothing's more deflationary than a deflationary uh, equity and, and uh, asset market. And that's what you're seeing right now. Uh, but that also brings opportunity. A lot of babies being found out with the bathwater right now, and you need to be prepared. Okay, so that's what we're to help you do. Now let's get oh, to our first listener question now at eight 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 ninety nine chart. Hey Stephen Justin, this is Aaron in Louisiana. I was going to ask about VPU Vanguard Utilities ETF. I was just wondering what y'all's thoughts are on utilities in the near future and maybe for a long-term hold any information you have i appreciate thank you all right this is the vanguard utility etf vpu is the symbol uh 10 basis point expense ratio let me look at uh, the xlu that also has a 10 basis point expense ratio so uh equal cost there and similar yields similar holdings and really just this is just about the utility sector as a whole and clearly it has good relative strength, even in a higher interest rate environment, which typically, you know, that is bad for utilities. This has been a really strong sector, one of the strongest sectors outside of energy in the markets uh, so far this year. So in times like this, the economy is slowing, money tends to flow to the non-cyclical businesses that aren't affected much uh, by uh, higher commodity costs. And utilities are, are one of those. In fact, they're able to pass on along with a lot of their higher costs to their consumers because their profit margins are basically guaranteed. They're, they're usually regulated and that means that uh, their profits are maybe relatively low, but they're guaranteed uh, by local municipalities. And so that's why their business tends to be relatively strong. And so uh, I like utilities in this time. And now the question is long-term, the average utility is probably overvalued, if I'm being frank. Uh, there are opportunities, uh, but in general, if you look at, I'm looking at the top 10 holdings here on, on Morningstar, eight of them are two out of five star, according to Morningstar, one of them is three star and one of them is one star. So it just shows, you know, three stars, basically it's uh, about uh, average value. And this is just going based on Morningstar's uh, uh, analysis. So, uh, you know, they could be wrong each individually, but in aggregate, you can see what kind of uh, premium that they're, they're trading at. So it's not exactly the cheap, not very cheap long term, uh, but near term, I definitely think it's going to hold that much better than the overall market. And uh, it has so far, and I think it will continue to until we, you know, shift to back to a growth, uh, gr you know, growing economy and where we find that that market and economic bottom. Uh, but until then, this will likely hold up well, but not something you want to be holding long, long term at these levels. Now, this is Invest Talk. We are happy, very happy to hear your caller questions that come in via voice bank recordings. But it's worth mentioning that for listeners who want a bit more interaction with their questions, calls, live calls are helpful. So from four to five Pacific time, you can always reach out and talk to us directly. Our number never changes. It's 888-99-CHART. Why do listener questions make Invest Talk better? Which of these would you recommend? Because each caller presents fresh questions in their voice. I was curious if you still think aluminum has a ways to go from here. When do I know the right time to take profits? Should I be looking for an exit? Should I be holding here? And listeners instinctively realize that Invest Talk uniquely offers a welcome dose of investing satisfaction. I think you have a terrific show, and I've learned a whole lot. Hey guys, love your show. Uh, I've been listening for several years now, and I've learned a lot. Justin Klein and Steve Peasley understand what investors need and want. I would look at it from a tax perspective. If there's no tax implications, 
move on, find better ways to use that money. I'm going with the odds. I think a half position now would at least get you in it and get you watching it so you won't lose track of it. Don't forget to call Investor. 888-99-CHART. One of the most rewarding things I do each weekday is host the Invest Talk podcast. I truly enjoy helping investors, and I know that every question counts and every answer I provide will be unbiased. So as long as your questions involve the stock market or general investment topics and definitions, we set no limits. You, the caller, get to chart the course for each Invest Talk podcast. Justin and I are ready. Are you? Call with your questions anytime, day or night, 888 99Chart. Good afternoon. This is Sarah calling from Delaware. And I have a question about a closed end fund that I had for many years. It is F A X, that's FAX. And, you know, it, it holds sovereign funds, sovereign wealth funds, predominantly, as, as I see it, from you know, Asia Pacific, Australia, and other Asian nations. It is way down. It's down two points from where I bought it. It's down into the twos. And and I bought it at in the high threes or even four. And I wonder why it would be down so much because it owns sovereign wealth funds. So I would like to understand what you think about this fund and why is to keep it or do I need to sell a little bit? Thank you. Bye. All right. This is the Aberdeen Asia Pacific Income Fund. And you're a little bit off on what they hold. What they hold are bonds in different Asian, Asia Pacific countries. So top holding would be Australia, uh, Mexico. Interesting. I don't know if that's Asia Pacific, but Mexico, Indonesia, Malaysia, China. Uh, you have Republic of Korea, Indonesia, et cetera. And what you did here was you chased yield without understanding your risk. And what is the risk here? It is currency risk. And that's the problem is that it might be paying some sort of a yield, but when the, the, the value of that currency that's being paid out in, whether that's Australian dollars or Mexican pesos or Malaysian you know, currencies, uh, Ch- uh, Chinese yuan, uh, et cetera, all of these are going down in value in relation to the dollar and this is unhedged and so when the dollar is weak this is going to do well when it's not so, when it's strong this is not going to do very well so you're going to be attracted by this 12 and a half percent yield that it currently has and you know it probably was uh, lower than that when you bought it but uh you know that's that's the issue here is the dollar is just simply very strong compared to many of these uh, these currencies and you're taking a ton of, of of currency risk as well as potential credit risk. Now, all, most of these are big, big, con- big countries uh, that probably aren't going to default on the debt, have control of their own uh, currency. But that means their currency is declining in value uh, if they are printing money. For example, Japan is a good example. So, um, so this is just very high risk. It's a very high risk bond fund. It's also let me see, is it levered? Yeah, so there's 33% leverage too. So you have a levered bet on foreign bonds that have tons of currency risk. The dollar is strong. Interest rates are rising. That's why this is just in a brutal downturn. And, you know, we'll get a counter trend rally if the dollar bottoms. Yes. And I think, you know, that's probably in the next uh, few months when the, the Fed starts to talk about a pause and that will bring relief to uh, the the equity markets, uh, asset markets abroad, and probably weaken the dollar. You're already seeing that a little bit so far, and you're starting to get hints of that. Um, so, but but longer term, I just don't think this is a good place to be uh, because you know we're we're going to have an inflationary environment. The Fed's going to be more on the path of tightening policy versus uh, loosening policy, and so on rallies, I would definitely be selling this. Uh, not a name that you want to be tied to in for safe income because it's certainly not safe. Thanks for the call. 8899 chart 8899242780 is how you get through and ask your question on today's show and after the break 
we're gonna get into our main focus point, which is about I bonds. And then I really wanna get into these new housing numbers that came out yesterday. A lot of a lot of interesting insight into uh, some, some trends, uh, seven months in a row of weakening housing sales. And I wanna talk a little bit about what you should expect. And I talked yesterday about it, but I wanna expand on that uh, with these new numbers. So give me a call, 888-99-CHART. Invest Talk is here to help. And when you download the free Invest Talk podcasts, don't forget to rate and review. The phone lines are open 888-99 chart. Now my main focus point today is in regards to I bonds. So we're going to do a little update here and it's remember I bonds are government guaranteed and a lot of people have fallen in love with them recently and i've actually had people say oh you don't like i bonds and i'm not sure why people say that um i've always i always kind of give the pros and cons for every investment i always try to do that eyes wide open so you are never surprised by anything and so i think for the right people for a lot of people uh, i bonds are fairly attractive uh, right now now the Core inflation rose 0.6% in August, and this will benefit I-bond holders, uh, but not directly, uh, at least not between now and uh, I believe that's February. Yeah, February. Now, how I-bonds work is that there's a guaranteed rate, and it's based on what happened in the past. Ibon yields lag what is happening today. Okay, they they're based on what occurred several months ago, and so September's inflation report, while it looked like it was hot, is actually going to have a reduced impact on the payout. Oh, in, in next spring. Now, the current figure of nine point six two percent annualized for uh, the next uh, until uh, March. Excuse me. It, based on inflation between October 21st, sorry, October 2021 <laughs> of last year and March of this year. Okay. And those that don't buy or own I bonds right now are going to get that yield, excuse me, yeah, until February, not March, February of next year. And then they'll be assigned a different payout. And that will be based on the five months from April of this year to August of this year. And if things remain relatively unchanged for September, that'll be the six months, then the end, the, the payout will go down to 6.03% for the six months after. Okay, so it's going 9.6 to 6.03. Now you're gonna say, well, that, that dropped a lot. Well, you're still getting annualized total if you bought an I-bond today, 7.8%, which is much better than you're gonna get from treasuries, from CDs, from pretty much, from, from most, uh, relatively safe investments right now okay so they are still attractive but you can see there that that nine point something percent yield is not something that you should expect forever in fact you should expect it to come down relatively dramatically now the good thing is i bonds are sheltered from federal taxes until they are redeemed that's one thing you need to know not like a normal bond or CD where you're going to get paid out in, uh, an interest payment every single uh, month or six months or whatever. I bonds accrue interest along the way until you redeem them. Okay. When you cash out the total gain, that's what's going to be taxable to you. Now, what are some disadvantages of I bonds? One is the investment limit. We've talked about that $10,000 per person. Now, you can do husband and wife, you can do it for kids, and you can even do it in the name of a business or a living trust. And that can certainly expand your the, the amounts you can buy in I-bonds um, over you know, just your individual uh, purchase, okay? Now they can be a bit inconvenient. So they must be held with the US Treasury, and they're, so they're separate from your other assets. So it's not like you can, uh, put it at your bank and watch it and see it accrue interest or anything like that. You got to keep track of it 
separately. It can't be commingled with uh, an adjoint account or something like that. It's an individual account at the treasury. And then the last one that most people don't think about very much, it's inheritance. If you die, who's going to be able to find out that you have that on record at the, uh, at the treasury? There's not a robust paper trail like there is with your brokerage accounts or your investment account. And there's not secondary beneficiaries as well. So if you have a husband and, husband and wife, only the husband and wife know about it, and they're each the beneficiary on their I bonds and they get in a car accident and, uh, or whatever, it's going to go into probate, okay? Uh, because there's not that secondary beneficiary. So that's one little quirk there. But once again, it's not something that I say is, is bad. With that nice seven, even going forward, expecting a total of roughly a little shy of 8% over the next year, that's pretty good. Now you do have to hold it for a year, so it's illiquid. So if you're gonna need the money and for any particular reason, you can't go get it after, uh, until a year's passed. And after a year, between a year and five years, you have to give up three months of interest, which that's another potential drawback. But even if you give up, a quarter of that uh, near the 8%, that's still call it 6% net. Still pretty good compared to the average CD yielding three, three and a half percent. Okay. So I bonds, a little update there. Uh, I know a lot of people like them. A lot of people have gotten into them, but understand there are pros and cons. And and, and right now, typically the, pro, the, the pros are going to outweigh the cons, but just with anything, you have to be aware of the other side. Now, the next invest stock, the story behind this question is thematic investing something you should consider. Thematic investing is a type of investing approach that prioritizes trends predicted to be successful over the long term instead of investing in specific companies or sectors. Steve will get to that story tomorrow, but for now, I'm Justin Klein and I'm ready to take your questions live at 888 chart What's the big deal, deal? Where can you get pizza, bread twists, specialty chicken, and more for just five ninety nine dollars each? Is it at Domino's? He hands off hand-tossed pizza and a marble cookie brownie. He's going, going, going! There's a lot of variety on the radio and at Domino's, too, where you can... Mix and match two or more. 5 dollars each at Domino's. Two item minimum pan pizza, bone and wings, and bread bowls will be extra. Ask for this limited time offer. Prices, participation, delivery area, and charges may vary. When Big Mobile charges you an arm and a leg, they're taking your money and your power. And your arm and leg. Boost Mobile gives your power back with an unlimited plan for $25 a month on one of America's largest 5G networks. We can't give you back your arm and your leg because we're not qualified surgeons. Unless you're an iguana who can grow limbs back. Switch to Boost and get an unlimited plan for $25 a month. Boost Mobile. Unleash your power. New customers only. One line, $25 per month with auto pay. Additional restrictions apply. See BoostMobile.com for details. Have you heard about risk allies? It's a brief question and answer form that you fill out online. Steve Peasley and Justin Klein will also get a copy of your responses. They can use the Riskalyze results to help you formulate a strategy that fits your investing risk tolerance. Learn more anytime and take the Riskalyze quiz at investtalk.com. Hi, this is SO calling. I'm just wondering if you get some advice from a 51-year-old man who's been an artist all of his life and uh, various degrees of financial success, but really none that will carry me into my retirement years, set me up for financial security. I'm just wondering, how does one even approach that at my age and with um, not a wealth of job or professional experience that pays the rate that I've ever gotten? So um, <laughs> just asking that. Thank you. Well, the first thing is you're, you're not alone. There are plenty of 50 plus year olds that have not socked much if at all away for retirement and, and don't think about it. And many people don't think about it until they uh, hit that, that age of 50. Um, so I don't think you're too early, but it's certainly more challenging than if you started in your 20s. And most people should start uh, in their 20s. And the number one Thing to think about is saving is being able to systematically save 
you said you're an artist and that probably means that you don't have a 401k or an IRA or anything like that. Uh, and the reason why 401ks are so effective and the largest retirement nest egg that most people have or the, the largest vehicle for that is because of that consistent systematic savings that happens every paycheck. Don't even think about it. You don't have to manually go do it. You don't have to see that money in your bank account and be, be urged to or have that urge to go spend it in any, in any way. Uh, it automatically goes into that 401k. And so that's the number one thing you need to start doing is find a way to systematically save in whether that's an IRA. You know, we have clients, they have IRAs and the automatic, they have an automatic setup and, uh, you know, 6,000 limit per year. They do $500 per month. They don't even think about it. And it goes into their IRA. Systematic, it's easy. And that's the first step. Then the investment, that's next. You're not going to reach retirement and hit uh, a grand slam and on, on, on one investment. That's not really what the, the stock market or bond market's for. Uh, you're very unlikely to strike it rich. This is a get rich slowly type of endeavor. And you need to understand that. And so the first step is a savings habit. Thanks for the call. Now let's touch on the housing market and uh, new data shows that for the seventh straight month, August saw a decline in home sales and first time buyers have really been priced out of the market and existing home homeowners are opting to stay rather than sell their current homes and mainly get rid of their low mortgage, right? And this is something they, they call it rate locked. And I think this is if you're looking at the data of new supply, you think, hey, the housing market's weakening. Uh, people want to sell. They want to they're lock in those high prices. But you got to live somewhere. And most sellers of homes are also a buyer of a home somewhere else. And that means that unless they are moving out of state, it happens a lot here in California where you sell your house for a million dollars. A lot of basic homes, regular homes are, are worth a million. You go buy in the Midwest or the South and uh, for three, two, three, four hundred thousand dollars and you have you had so much equity in your home that you paid for cash for it and for those buyers i think there's still room for that but for those that are staying within the same area even if they're downsizing they're still probably don't they probably don't want to give up their three percent mortgage for a six percent mortgage and that's a real i think issue uh for the housing market and the correction that we're seeing and that's why i think this is going to be more of a slow bleed you know, 08 was just the housing market bleeding out, right? It was uh, fire sales, foreclosures, people that couldn't afford their their, their, their loans, uh, banks that were foreclosing and, and, and trying to sell and just try to get any anything for uh, the asset that they don't really want to hold. And so, but, but now that kind of the opposite's happening. Uh, people have refinanced to such low rates and their carrying costs is so low for a, their home that they're kind of stuck. And the uh, to me, the only other potential sellers would be the big institutions, which is only about 1% of the market, uh, the, the rental market where, you know, the Blackstones of the world went and bought a bunch of uh, rentals and, and started renting those out. I think they will start to sell slowly, uh, but they're not going to be fire selling because they don't need to. They'll probably slow, sell opportunistically and reinvest that money at a higher cap rate, higher yields within, say, the, the corporate bond market, for example. There's much better opportunity in the corporate bond market than there is in uh, real estate rentals right now. Uh, but they're not fire selling. And that's the issue here is there's nobody in the market that just has to sell their home. You know, home flippers maybe, but that's usually the high end and that's certainly weakening. Uh, but overall, consumers are spending less on housing related purchases, uh, or, or, or housing related items, furniture, appliances. Uh, so that's what the Fed wants, right? They, they want uh, that low pressure on those demand for those things so that inflation can kind of come back in. Now, sale of previously owned homes dropped 0.4% in August from July, year over year, down 20%, okay? And this is the weakest rate since May of 2020. Why? Because the mortgage rate is now top 6%. 
when it was below 3% a year earlier. Now, homes typically go under contract a month or two before the actual contract closes. So this is reflective more of rates that are sub 6%, actually closer to 5% like they were in June, in July, you know, uh, in July, really. And the medium home price is still up year over year, but it's the second straight month that it has fallen from a high of 413,800 in June to 389,500 in August. And that's likely to continue uh, because the affordability is near its lowest level in decades because of those high rates and high prices. And consumer sentiment towards housing fell in August, the lowest level since 2011. And in the four weeks ending September 11th, 7.2% of homes on the market had a price drop. That's up from 3.8% a year earlier and homes on average sold for 0.5% below their list price compared to one point compared with 1.1 above list price a year earlier. So you see, it's now clearly a buyer's market where if you want to sell your home, you're probably going to have to take some sort of a discount to what you're asking. And, uh, and like I said, the lack of uh, the limited supply of homes is what's going to limit the potential fall. Okay. And, and, and this is why I actually think home builders are still going to do relatively well. One fourth of home builders surveyed reduced their prices over the past month. But remember they have room to, they have margins. They can, they can reduce prices and still make money. Uh, whereas most buy, most sellers, they, they, they're kind of clinging to, uh, that price they saw earlier this year, late last year. And frankly, because of the cost of capital, especially you're in that middle market, um, 10, 15% lower should not shock anyone, should not shock anyone. And you can see that with the supply uh, that there was a rush of supply in the spring coming on, but that steadily declined throughout the summer. You would think that would accelerate with prices uh, coming under pressure. Uh-uh, it's not happening. And mainly because of people are rate, rate locked and they feel like they've missed their window to sell for a lot of people. And frankly, if you're clinging on to those old prices, you probably have. Now, summer is over. The autumn holiday season is coming up fast. So keep in mind that while summer may have ended, the market volatility has not. You've seen that today and yesterday. And that means you need to pay attention. And it takes, it's worth taking a minute to maybe doing a free portfolio review assessment with myself or Steve Peasley. At our company, KP Financial, where we practice parallel investing and we provide unbiased guidance both on and off air. So if you are confused whether you have the right strategy, whether your advisor is, you know, not, not doing you a good service, well, reach out to me or Steve and we'd love to connect the short period of time. And the sooner you contact us, the sooner we can get your portfolio optimized. 8899 chart, 8899 Next up, another Invest Talk listener question. So hang on. Why do listener questions make Invest Talk better? Which of these would you recommend? Because each caller presents fresh questions in their voice. When do I know the right time to take profits? And listeners instinctively realize that Invest Talk uniquely offers a welcome dose of investing satisfaction. I think you have a terrific show and I've learned a whole lot. So don't forget to call Invest Talk 888-99 chart. Justin and Steve, this is Matt from South Florida. I have a question about a general advice for the next 6 to 8 months. At this point, I'm not putting any new retirement money into the market. I have it going straight into a money market and I do realize that requires diligence to make sure that when I feel the bottom is hit to redirect those funds back into the market at a certain time. But with respect to, I heard Steve say that there's really not much to hurry into at this point. Is a short-term corporate bond fund something to look into? I thought maybe I'd be late to the party, but it does appear that it continues to go down from over the last 30, 45 days, even the last five days. Particularly, I was looking at VCSH, Victor, Charlie, Sam, Houston, Vanguard short-term corporate bond fund. Holding this as a way to put new money into the market over the next three to six to nine months, in this case, it would be the bond market. Wanted to get your thoughts on that strategy. Thank you. 
Well, I think long term, if you were trying to add bond exposure to your portfolio, I think this is a fairly good instrument. This is the Vanguard short term corporate bond ETF VCSH. Uh, the effective duration is under three years. The effective maturity is 3.1 years. So right on a three year mark, which is which is good, relatively short term. And as interest rates go up, it's going to start to things are going to mature and they'll be able to reinvest that uh, those maturities into higher yields. And I think that overall is good. Now, near term, you're going to it's still going to go down if interest rates go up just because that's lower duration risk doesn't mean that it there's no duration risk because this is uh, gone from the low 80s back in September all the way down to the mid 70s. So about 10 percent drop since then uh, because of where interest rates are uh, and that. That makes sense, right? You have to take the maturity, take the uh, the duration. It's called three years, multiplied by the uh, the the move in interest rates, which has been about three hundred basis points since last uh, last fall, and you get that roughly ten percent drop, and that's what you've seen. Now you've made some of that up with a decent yield, but um, you know I look at this more of a way to a good way to gain exposure to the bond market if you want that as part of your portfolio. Now, is this a place to hide out? Probably not. And frankly, I actually think I'm getting a lot of calls like this. I think sentiment is really bad. And I'd actually be the opposite. I, this is a time where you want to leg in to the market over the next three to six months. You're talking about adding this over the next three to six months. You're, you're, you're off. You're off on timing. There's a, the, the, is there more, could there be more downside for the market? Sure, absolutely. But there's way more opportunities out there that I'm seeing than there is this dire situation. Like I said before, it's a lot of, a lot of reversion to the mean happening right now. And people are feeling that as, Everything's going to hell in a handbasket. It's very common to see a low in the markets late September, early October. You're getting the sentiment lining lining up, starting to see some signs from the dollar weakening, especially against the yen. Uh, you're seeing some inflection points out there in the market. A lot of today's market didn't make sense for a risk off environment. The VIX really wasn't up much. So these are things that are lining up to say, this is the time where you want to be taking risks. When it feels the hardest to buy, that's the time you want to buy. Now let's play two in a row from 8 at 8, 99 chart. Yeah, this is James from Georgia. Guys, I just saw a very a commercial, very compelling about silver. It's from Lear Capital. And it had this one gentleman who was wearing these glasses, very, very smart looking. And he stated unequivocally that he likes silver. So what do I do? Do I buy a big old chunk of silver and stick it in the basement? Is that what I'm supposed to do? If, you know, if, if there's all this uh, like and love for silver, I'll listen to the podcast and wait for your answer. We really enjoy the show. All right. Thanks for the call. Now, the first thing is never make an investment decision because you saw a commercial. Never, ever, 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 ever. Don't, don't do that. That's absolutely the not, not the way to make a decision, okay? Just because somebody looks smart, speaks eloquently, does not mean that, that that's who you should be listening to. Same with me, right? You listen to me, you listen to Steve, we hopefully give you some good insights, but we also should not be your end-all, be-all source for information, for perspective. It should be one piece of the puzzle, okay? So... That's first off, get that out of your mind. Never ignore all commercials, investment commercials, okay? Do your own research, uh, get your own ideas. Second, silver, do I think it's a good time to buy? I do. Uh, you're starting to see last week uh, that surge in silver and it's been consolidating this recent move, even though the Fed has been hawkish, even though the dollar has been strong. I said at the top of the show that when you see a market event, like a hawkish Fed rate hike and an asset that, is supposed to go down in that environment does not that is a message the market is telling you something and so i do think it is a good time to get in silver but not because some guy with glasses that looks smart 
on TV told me so because of what I'm seeing in the markets. Thanks for the call. This is Invest Talk. I'm Justin Klein. We have one goal here is to help you achieve your own version of financial freedom. And our work continues after this final break. So if you're going to call, you want to do that right now at 888 chart. You are listening to Invest Talk. Every Friday on the program and the podcast, Steve Peasley shares highlights from the newest edition of the KPP Premium Newsletter. Listen Fridays to Invest Talk. And now, Steve and Justin welcome your calls and questions. 888 99 Chart. Hi, Steve and Justin, Art from Tucson. Wondering your thoughts on PIMCO Income Fund Institutional Class, P I M I X, as part of a diversified retirement account and a long term hold. Love to hear your thoughts on it. Let's not podcast. Thanks. Bye. All right, this is the PIMCO Income Institutional Fund and expense ratio about 0.5%, which is about average for this sector. And this is a relatively short-term bond fund, 2.5 year effective duration. And it's spread between government bonds, corporates, securitized, cash and equivalents, and some others. So uh, I like the diversity here. And it's a Long term, it's a it's one of the the better funds within this diverse uh, sector bond sector, and it's relatively short term, so I like that. So overall, I'm going to give Pimco Income uh, a thumbs up. P I M I X. If you're looking for relatively short term bond exposure and diversified bond exposure, uh, understand that there may be some trading costs as well within your brokerage firm. So make sure that you get the share class that. Uh, has no transaction fees, et cetera. So if you want to sell it, you can do that without really a cost, all right? So I just want to give you a heads up and uh, giving PIMCO income a thumbs up. Now, lastly, I want to touch on some of the large banks' CEOs testifying in front of Congress yesterday. And they were grilled. Some of it was a lot of political grandstanding per usual. But they talked about the industry as a whole and how uh, there's still a lot of uncertainty uh, about the economy going forward. Now, uh, the big names were J.P. Morgan's Jamie Dimon, as well as Citigroup's Jan uh, Jan Frazier. And Jamie Dimon says that competing forces are are impacting the economy. Consumer spending is high and jobs are plentiful, but there are supply chain disruptions, obviously uh, war in Ukraine, and actually declining consumer confidence. So while people are still spending, their confidence is uh, is waning and uh so that is a tell on future uh consumer spending and uh, more of a forward-looking indicator now all the ceos raised their hand when asked who had confidence that the fed will have the resolve to fight inflation so they all believe the fed when they say that they are going to continue to tighten aggressively but fraser said higher rates are likely to moderate growth and in the us and other countries and she said, quote, we are very concerned about the high prices that consumers are facing in America and indeed around the world. So uh, they're also worried about uh, inflation and how that will impact their ability to pay their debts, governments or, or, or individuals to pay their debts. Now, Jamie Dimon praised the 2010 Dodd-Frank financial overhaul bill, but said that it probably went a little too far. And this was the interesting part for me about this whole uh, whole hearing was on bank requirements. Now, uh, everyone looks at a recession and they say, oh, wait, it's happening again. And, and uh, you know, because especially because housing is uh, is kind of the epicenter so far of the economic weakness. But the banks are not nearly as levered to the price of how homes. Uh, the those that have mortgages, even though the price of their home will will likely go down, they're still able to pay their mortgage because they, they lended uh, they lent they were lending uh, more conservatively and more responsibly and. So a wave of foreclosures is probably unlikely. But what's most interesting is that while they have huge capital buffers, what they argue is too big and applies mostly to larger firms. That's why I always talk about the regional banks being better bets because they have more flexibility and uh, able to earn a higher profits. But the, the treatment of treasuries, which the Fed had allowed temporary pandemic retrieve for them being part of the, the total assets, 
uh, that expired last year. And it promised, uh, it, it, they're promised to propose a broader revamp of the rule on these ultra safe assets like treasuries, but they've yet to do that. But big but here, look what's happening in the treasury market right now. And today with a 10 year up 20 basis points, that's kind of a, a market that is uh, becoming unmoored, right, from its foundation. And the next phase of this is going to al be allowing banks to go out there and buy treasuries. And I think that's what they're going to do. When you see that, that's a big risk on event, risk on. So be on the watch for that is when the Fed proposes that. And I believe if you continue to see higher rates, especially in the long end, you're going to see that. And uh, that will feed in to the cost of capital and treasury rates and the broader economy. Now, I'm Justin Klein. This completes another Invest Talk program. Steve Peasley and I thank you for listening. We encourage you to tell your friends and family about our free podcast downloads and our official total now has exceeded 45.3 million. Thanks to you. Now get your Invest Talk podcast anytime at iTunes, Spotify, or Google Play. And be sure to rate and, re rate and review on iTunes as well. Independent thinking, shared success. This is Invest Talk. Good night. Invest Talk is a trademark of KPP Financial. Because of the nature of the interactive dialogue inherent in the format of this program, it's important for the listener to understand that not all comments made will apply to them. Specifically, nothing said shall be taken to be investment advice, or shall statements on this program be considered an offer to buy or sell security. Because such advice is rendered solely on an individual basis, and at times will require that the investor review a prospectus before investing. Invest Talk is a copyrighted program of Klein, Pavlis, and Peasley Financial, a registered investment advisor firm which retains all rights. For more information regarding KPP's investment advisors, call 1 800 557 5461. Steve Peasley is president, and Justin Klein is chief executive officer of Klein, Pavlis, and Peasley Financial. Thank you for listening, and your comments and questions are welcome on our 24 hour listener line at 888 99 Chart.